I'm Realtor Deb Tomorrow, and this is At Home in Bloomington, brought to you by Karen Russell, Ruoff Home Mortgage. We profile the people, places, and resources that make Bloomington Bloomington and help you live your best life at home in Bloomington. All right, hello, and welcome to At Home in Bloomington. I'm your host, Realtor Deb Tomorrow, joined as always, by the lovely Miss Karen Rastel. Hey, Deb. How are you? I'm great today. Thanks for sponsoring our show. My pleasure. Ruoff Home Mortgage. Um, so if you've got any mortgages, there's your little plug. Um, I want to jump right into today's episode because um, it's going to, I think, stretch our brains a little bit. My brain is always stretched for these podcasts. For these po- no, yes. but like, like your husband should be here for this one. Okay. Because I think he would really, he would be explaining things so. to us. Numbers. Mm. There's going to be numbers involved it, in there this. There will probably be some numbers <laughs> okay. involved and okay. some, yeah, exactly. But I wanted to talk a little bit. Yeah, our last episode, um, we actually just recorded that a couple of days ago, but um, the, the previous episode in our, our line, I think we're 40, I don't know, five or something, uh, we spoke with Michelle Pruitt, who is the co founder of Uplands Peak Sanctuary. Um, and I hope it came through in our chat how, with her, how impressed I was with her perseverance. Um, and pressing on when she saw a need and, and pressing on when, you know, on something that she believed in. Right. And I think that has become a theme for, especially for this season. And maybe that's me and where I am in my life and I'm running everything through this filter, but everybody who's coming through the door, it's like, you know, they saw a need for something. It wasn't easy to get it done, mm-hmm. but they persevered and they continue to persevere. You know, and we've spoken with like Bloomington Hardware, who's been in business for um, 90 years mm-hmm. and some of these uh, companies and organizations that have been around for a really long time. So today is no exception. Okay. I know you don't know who our guest is, but you keep looking at her like, I know her from somewhere. So I, I feel like I do. I feel there's a connection, but yeah. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, so you and I came to Bloomington about the same time, my okay. first time around. Early 90s. Early 90s. And do you remember who our mayor was at the time? If I saw the name on the sign, um, Tal Faro. No. 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 That was a judge. Yeah. Hang on. Why well, no. do you know judges, Karen? No. <laughs> well, um... No, I know. No Tommy Allison. Yes. And so to me, so I was like, yes, like, yes I can exactly, see the sign right? you came up um, of College Avenue. Okay. And to so. me, Mayor Allison is like my mayor because she was like the mayor when I came to town and really, okay. you know, was introduced to Bloomington. You always sort of associate like growing up. To me, the mayor of Indianapolis will always be Bill Hudnut because that's who the mayor was when I was growing up, you know? I don't know. So anyways, this idea um, of the organization we're talking to today actually came from Tommy Allison. Okay. Um, about the time that we came to Bloomington, you and I. And uh, I love this story. There's a video on YouTube that talks about the history and it's Mayor Allison sort of talking about um, this idea that she had this idea. She thought it was really good. She went to the community to talk about the idea and people weren't that excited. They were not as excited as I think she thought they should be, but she knew it was a good idea. Mm-hmm. So she's going to persevere. Right. So she did, uh, went to someone who, again, is another common th- theme through so many of our episodes, Herman Wells. Okay. I swear, like every episode, they're like, well, we went and talked to Herman Wells and, you know, I, he helped us. It's like six degrees episode. separation from Herman Wells. You know my Herman Wells story. Um, does it have to do with I, an instrument? No. Okay. <laughs> That's bizarre, but no. Why well, would have thought you were going to say that you have played the bassoon for Herman Wells? Yeah. No, I never did that. Uh, no, when I, I never met the man, but when I was in college and he was still alive, he lived in a house across the street from the library on campus, mm-hmm. and he had um, people that lived at his house, like students that lived at his house and helped him with things because he was elderly. And my friend Chris Raver, who's Tanya's brother, um, was one of his you know people that helped at his okay. house. And uh, Herman Wells was out of town, and Chris was like, "Come on over, let's oh, swim gosh. in the pool." <laughs> in the oh, indoor goodness. pool, so we went over and we swam in the pool, and I think we drank some of his booze. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, anyways, I feel connected to him because I've been in his house. But anyways, so Mayor Allison went to Herman Wells, shared her idea. And it was so. <laughs> okay. Um, through some, maybe not that easily, but um, through support. I think one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm learning over doing you know, all these episodes we've done of At Home in Bloomington was that um, you know, Chancellor Wells was very focused on the town and gown. Mm-hmm. So not one or the other, but, you know, both of them being strong. Right. Um, so, okay. So that's the story of how it started. Okay. No clue. No, but I feel like this was just recently in the newspaper or something because I feel like there, 
there was some, when you mentioned uh, the mayor's name, mm-hmm. and her, I feel like I've just recently read something. Well, um, she was in the news lately, I think, okay. weighing in on some things. But mm-hmm. um, I know you've heard of this organization. I've heard of it, too, but I don't feel like I've ever had a clear understanding okay. of what it is, what it provides. And so that's what we're going to do today. So I introduce you, Tina Peterson of the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. Okay. Uh, Okay. Karen yeah. used to work for a bank that I think has been a big supporter of yes, um, the for, Community Foundation. For, year, for years. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. And I think even the bank before the Old National, National mm-hmm. purchased Monroe Bank. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Mark um, Bradford was a big supporter. Yes, I think he probably was. still. Dave Bear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm thinking that that may be where, because when you were at work, well, Tony, there was yeah, and Tony has done things yeah. for the, yeah. So that's why I said he needs to be here today. So. <laughs> okay. Now that I've spoken for way too long, Tina, welcome. Thank you for joining Thank us you. today. Um, like I said, I feel like this is going to challenge us a little bit because as I was doing research, I'm like, oh, annuity. Yep. I kind of know what that is, but I don't really, but I don't want to get that. I don't know. We might get that deep, but I want to know, know from you, I kind of told the history without saying who it was, but what's your story of the history of the foundation, how it came to be? Well, it didn't involve Herman Wells Pool or anything. No, but, or his um, booze. Or his booze. So I don't think I have any stories quite that exciting. But, yeah, no, I think you got it absolutely correct. Uh, maybe the missing piece is that, you know, Indiana has 94 community foundations. Wow. Right? So we have a community foundation in every county, 92 counties, plus a couple extra ones. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, and it really was because of the Lilly Endowment. So okay. right about 1990, about the time it sounds like we all yep. came to Bloomington, yep. Lilly Endowment decided that the most impactful thing they could do is one of the largest philanthropies in the country, mm-hmm. was they could create local philanthropic experts in every community in Indiana. And so they really uh, seeded community foundations. And so they encouraged communities to come together mm-hmm. and um, to begin to build a strategy and to advance its concept of a, a local philanthropic entity that has no constraints around what they can support, right? Mm-hmm. So unlike most nonprofits or foundations, we don't just focus education on education or health or we can actually do anything. I say everything from dogs to art to poverty, I mean, yeah. we can support any host of um, needs, right? So in, in a way, I like to think that we are really sort of a an organization with a big philanthropic heart, yeah. right? Um, but our heart is only a reflection of the community, mm. right? So we are an organization that really exists, we say, to create impact through innovation and transformation, uh, to make philanthropy achievable for anyone and everyone in the community, and we connect, right, with many different organizations, so... We've given money to 400 different nonprofits in Monroe County, which is crazy. In the last, th- you know, almost 30 years, and it's crazy to think that there. I don't know if there are currently 400 nonprofits, but there are that many nonprofits. It's, mm-hmm. it's, yeah, it's crazy to think that when um, Mayor Allison went into the community to t- start talking about um, a community foundation, she said that her response from the beginning was, you know, we have the IU Foundation, we have a hospital foundation, we have United Way, and this would just take money away from those. Mm -hmm. Do you still get that reaction, and how do you respond to that? We don't get that reaction, and in all honesty, we partner with all of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be just very honest with you, Mm -hmm. you know, there's something called the transfer of wealth, right? We Mm -hmm. look at how much money is going to transfer from one generation to the next, and in this community, that number is quite large, mm-hmm. right? Over the, the coming decades, there'll be a huge transfer of wealth from the older generation to the younger generations. And thinking about the size of the baby boomer population, mm-hmm. there is a lot of philanthropic money that potentially comes to play in this community. There is no reason why all of the, you know these entities can't coexist. We serve different purposes. Mm-hmm. I think all of them are incredibly important. We partner all the time with United Way. We work with the Health Foundation, the IU Health Foundation, the MCCSC IU Foundation. probably, yeah. Well, I, yes, for 10 years I was the director oh, okay. of the MCCSC Foundation. Okay. That was my sort of first role in philanthropy Great. was I spent 10 years okay. at the Foundation of Monroe County Community Schools yeah. before I came to the Community Foundation. And when I came, I've been there eight and a half years now. When I first came, they, the board said, you know what, we're just about 20 years old. We've done what we were supposed to, but we're ready to make 
take that next big leap, right? And so they gave me this great opportunity to come and, and look at the role of the community foundation in the community and see where do we need to go next. And so that's what we've been able to accomplish in the next eight years is to grow the community foundation to that next level of impact or importance in the community. So let's kind of get down to some basics. Um, and that is that, as I understand it, the foundation isn't out there providing volunteers or, you know, doing that kind of work. It's really financially focused. Mm -hmm. So how would you explain to someone like Karen and I <laughs> right. what it is that you do? Right. We exist only really to serve donor intent. That okay. Sense. So, yeah. so we have, um, and that's maybe a little oversimplification. Mm -hmm. We're okay with that. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we have 240 different funds at the Community Foundation. We're a super flexible organization. People come to us and say, this is what I'd like to do for the community. Either I'd like to do it today or I'd like to do it as part of my legacy when I'm no longer mm -hmm. here. But here's what, what I'm passionate about. Here's what I think I can do to help the community. How can you help me do that? Mm -hmm. And we have many different ways, different types of funds, different types of vehicles, different types of longevity. And we really can craft what, uh, you know, an individual or a family needs, right, to feel like they are pursuing their philanthropic passion. So those 240 funds, 90% of those are endowed, right? Meaning that the gift is made to us. We never touch it again. We invest it. Mm -hmm. And so every year we're going to look at a 16 quarter average of the fund balance and we're going to take 4.25% of that. At least right now, that's the percent we're using. And then we're going to distribute that back to the community year after year after year. So we're about perpetuity, right? Yeah. which sets us apart a little bit, right? We aren't an annual campaign kind of organization. We are continually raising money, sometimes for very specific needs, sometimes for unrestricted dollars, so we can be very responsive to what's most important in the community at any given point in time. I can give you an example of what that might mean yeah. today, right? So you think about in our current environment, what are the, some of the big issues that we're facing as a community and how can we help address them? Um, and so one example would be that we've joined with um, five other organizations to seed a crisis diversion center here, a 23-hour facility where people that are suffering from some sort of crisis, often opioid-related or substance-related, a place for them to go, right, where they're going to be connected with resources that keeps them off the streets, mm -hmm that police can bring them to instead of taking them mm. to jail mm -hmm. or the emergency room can send them to mm -hmm. if they don't really have a med an, an other type of medical need or a family member can bring them, right? Mm -hmm. It's a real missing gap in our continuum of care to address issues around substance mm -hmm. use. So that's an emerging need that we are helping to see this year. Um, we The board meeting I told you I just came from mm -hmm. this morning was from a small organization that we're incubating called CDFI Friendly Bloomington. And I've, I've, mm -hmm. I'm, I, yeah, I would love to hear more about that because right. I, I've seen that on, uh, as I was doing my research and mm -hmm. um, certainly financial, um, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but, you know, ability to manage your finances, no matter what those finances are. Right. It's about creative financing, me. right? So mm -hmm. CDFIs were started in the South uh, in the early 1900s, really, for oh, wow. those people that could not, um, they couldn't get bank financing. Traditional mm -hmm. financing was off the table. So at this point, think of people of color, mm -hmm. right? Different races that a bank would not loan sure. money to. That was really where their roots were. Mm -hmm. Today, CDFIs are across the country, and they create um, low-interest patient capital for things like affordable housing or small business startups or community facilities. And so... You know, we did not have a CDFI in our community, and they tend not to be present in smaller urban uh -huh. areas or in rural communities. And so we worked um, with actually entities across the country to identify what, what what's needed in small smaller communities to support creative financing. And we um, put forth this idea of a CDFI-friendly community. We're not creating our own CDFI, uh -huh. although we might, but we are actually becoming um, equipped to attract others to invest in our community for these mm -hmm. types of projects. So Kenzer Flats that you saw last week that was just announced, mm -hmm. a new affordable housing project mm -hmm. um, focusing a lot on people with substance issues, um, was partially funded by CDFI 
funding so CDFI friendly help facilitate and mm -hmm. bring a, a community development finance institution okay. to the community so so you're not just because I think at first glance I would think okay the foundation will they just give money to organizations when those organizations ask for money or you know write grants mm -hmm. or whatever but you're doing a lot more than just handing out money and stewarding money because you are also making these connections because we're and, using that money that's been entrusted to us. Yeah. Right? So we think we have both a reactive and a proactive side. Mm -hmm. So we have many funds that generate a distribution every year for uh, a local nonprofit that just support their operating, and they mm -hmm. get a check every single year mm -hmm. from us. We have other funds where a donor is selecting a particular need in the community and supporting it each year through a what we call a donor advice fund. So they're advising yeah. us on how to use their money. We have what's called field of interest funds where a donor says, I want to support animals or art or health care or homelessness. And we use those dollars every year to support those very specific things. And we often do that through competitive grant making mm -hmm. processes. What So we're right in the middle of that right okay. now. Some of our funds are for scholarships, right? So yeah. we're just... You would have seen in the paper yesterday Lily's that we announced Lily yeah. scholarships in the finalists. So those are our reactive dollars where we just give the money to organizations or we, we wait for a, a donor or an organization to come to us and say, I have a need, and we fund them. But there are other instances where we feel like our job is to step out and help identify the needs and use those unrestricted dollars that many donors have given us and say, what what does the community need today? Mm -hmm. Maybe one of our biggest is early childhood education, mm -hmm. right? We've been focusing on growing access and quality of early learning in Indiana now for the last 10 years. You know, we've um, we put about, mm, we're sneaking up on $2 million that we've put just into wow. early learning over the last few years. Mm -hmm. How do we create more quality preschool sites in the community? Mm -hmm. How do we um, make sure that those sites are quality and are certified as mm -hmm. quality? How do we support these mostly women working in their homes to, to, to support families mm -hmm. that work? How do we help support them in this essential work that they do, right? How do we engage parents in the learning of children? So that's called Monroe Smart Starts. So yes. That's another one of our sort of proactive initiatives is yeah. identifying a need like substance use, like um, creative financing in the community, like early learning. Um, and maybe our biggest one, so we also are the parent organization to a second nonprofit called Regional Opportunity Initiatives. Yeah. And ROI is uh, um, focused on economic and community prosperity in the 11 counties of what we call the Indiana Uplands. Mm -hmm. We call them that because we did a branding effort to rebrand the region and tell the story of a very humble part of Indiana. So we're focused on education, workforce, and quality of place mm -hmm. as it impacts prosperity of the people living in this region. We and got a $26 million grant from the Lily and Downs. I was gonna say that, that's works. backed by mm -hmm. Lily, because I know I've been to some meetings out in Owen County. Good. Um, yeah. I'm involved. Their quality of place plan? Yeah, yeah. I've, mm -hmm. uh, I'm have i involved over there mm -hmm. as I own property in Owen County, and um, and they've been doing amazing things in their town in, in right. Owen County and, and Spencer as well, so I wanted to support them. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, I've got some specific questions on how people can get involved and how people can get started um, in philanthropy. Um, and Karen, I hope you have some questions too. I do. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right, well, stick around and we'll be back. You are at home in Bloomington. Hi, this is Karen Rastel with Ruoff Home Mortgage. Did you know there are down payment assistance programs for first time buyers? A first time buyer is defined as having no home ownership in the last three years. These income based programs may help buyers with down payment or closing cost assistance. For additional details, contact me today at 812 606 7653. Ruoff Home Mortgage is an Indiana corporation licensed by the Indiana Department of Financial Institutions. This is not an offer for extension of credit or a commitment to lend. All loans must satisfy company underwriting guidelines, equal housing lender, NMLS number 141868. This is your real estate realist. Practical advice on buying and selling real estate based on my experience closing over 800 home sales. We're digging way back into the archives again today. Today's Real List comes from one of my favorite series of episodes of Real Real Estate Today podcast, Debunking Mortgage Myths. 
In our last episode, we talked about what it really means when your mortgage is sold and how that's probably not as evil as everyone thinks. So let's clear up another misconception I hear all the time, and that is, I don't want to get my credit pulled until I have an accepted offer on a house. The rationale is that we understand the more times our credit scores are pulled, that can cause our credit score to drop. But here's what you really need to know. Number one, it's true that a bunch of credit pulls can negatively impact your score. However, probably not by much. If you're running around getting every credit card known to man, then yes, it's going to hurt. But if you're shopping mortgages, multiple credit score pulls in a short period of time do not have much, if any, impact. The impact that it might have in your credit score may only be a few points and not enough to make a difference to most people. Number two, it's important to have a lender check your score rather than relying on what the internet says your credit score is because your credit score will be different depending on who is pulling it. There are more than 25 different algorithms for figuring credit scores, each giving different weight to different aspects of your score. Only a mortgage lender can tell you what your mortgage credit score is. And number three, also know your credit score early in the home buying process. Please don't wait until you find your dream home and then have your credit score pulled only to find out there's a mistake that will take six months to fix. It happens. I've seen it. So get your score pulled as soon as you start the home buying process. It will give you a more accurate picture of what you can afford and help ensure you never lose your dream home. To learn more about mortgage myths and arming yourself to be a smart mortgage consumer, listen to my Real Real Estate Today podcast, episodes number three and four. You can find it on iTunes, YouTube, and my website at homeinbloomington.com. My name is John Lee. Deb Tomorrow is my realtor. She has helped my wife and I sell two homes and purchase another. She's a smart, outside-the-box thinker and truly cares about her clients. Deb makes the complex world of buying and selling homes seem easy, which is a testament to her knowledge and skill. Long story short, Deb should be your realtor too. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to At Home in Bloomington. I'm Realtor Deb tomorrow. Before we get back to our guest, uh, Tina Peterson with the uh, Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County, I want to throw back to episode 23. I always have fun trying to like make the connections since I'm like preparing for a show and then how am I going to connect it to one of our past shows? Mm -hmm. Um, And so this one, Bloomington Creative Glass Center. But the reason I'm connecting to it is because they have been recipients of funds from the Community Foundation covering, I think it was a summer camp um, for kids and art and that kind of thing. And so, you know, it's not just opioid problem or affordable housing, which are all really important issues, but it's also arts, which is a really important right. issue and is what makes Bloomington Bloomington. So I want to encourage everyone to check out Bloomington Creative Glass Center. When Abby Gitlitz, who is the founder, was on our show last season, um, they were still working on getting their furnace up and running. Do you remember they would have to go up to Indianapolis to do the glass blowing? Well, they've got the furnace up and running now, so they're all sweating <laughs> I don't even know. It's like, uh, what is the furnace? It's like 20,000 degrees or something. I don't know what it is, but it's something crazy. So I want to congratulate her on persevering mm-hmm. to get that done because I that was no small feat to get that furnace installed and to have the building set up and all that. And they no longer have to go um, to Indianapolis to blow glass, which I think is wonderful. Um, and I'm hoping that they get some more grants from the Community Foundation. So, All right, let's talk about – I do want to talk about – Restricted versus unrestricted, real briefly, because um, I've served on a few nonprofit boards, and that was one of the things that I had never thought about until I was looking at budgets um, and restricted versus unrestricted. I think most of us want to give restricted funds. Can you tell us the difference? Because really what people want is unrestricted funds. Well, yes. I think a lot of organizations obviously are are focused on unrestricted funds. I think we like to have a healthy balance between them, right? So, you know, a restricted fund might be, I'll give you an example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, JC and Joni Halls, mm-hmm. uh, they have a fund at the Community Foundation called Never Lose Hoop. Never Lose Hoop is a fund, you know, obviously they have basketball, a whole connection yeah. to basketball. Sure. JC had suffered from cancer, mm-hmm. and he and his family wanted a fund that would help other families that were dealing with cancer. It's almost like a Make-A-Wish fund, mm-hmm. right? We They wanted to give families a moment mm. A t- uh, you know, a weekend, a few days where mm-hmm. they they wouldn't be focused completely on cancer, sure. right? And so they have helped these families that are 
Wow. Well, mostly the children are suffering from cancer or their parents mm-hmm. are. And and allowing them to achieve a little bit of a bucket list mm-hmm. moment, right, in their life, that means a lot to the whole family, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they've taken their personal experience and they have created an opportunity to help others um, in a way that many of us wouldn't think to do because we haven't lived that. Yeah. So it's lived experience for them. So they created a fund for that. That's a restricted fund. We are so proud of having that fund, right? Uh-huh. Um, and so it accomplishes fabulous things that we might not have even thought about doing were it not for the halls coming to us and saying, this is something we need to do in our uh-huh. community for families. So we really value those philanthropic ideas that other people have and bring to us and allow us to make possible, Mm -hmm. right? So we manage the fund for them. We help them with the process. We support them. You know, we don't run their fundraisers for them, but we show up and we handle some money for them. You know, so we can be, you know, really instrumental just even helping someone take an idea Mm -hmm. and bring it to reality. Now, do they have a nonprofit that they run it through, though? No. They don't? They run it through us. So they don't? Okay, so that's interesting. So, yeah, so they have a fund. It's called the Never Lose Hope Fund, and it's a field of interest fund Mm -hmm. at the Community Foundation. Okay. Other people just really need to have a connection with their giving, Mm -hmm. and we value that, too. Um, My family, Mm -hmm. right? We have the Peterson Family Fund. It's a donor advice fund. It's that we established it years ago um, with a little bit of money, and we grow it every Mm -hmm. single year. Um, and we get our family together. Our kids are now all adults, but we get them together once a year and we say, what is it that we want to do for the community this year? This is how much fun money our fund is distributing this. What do we want to do? We take a vote. I always get mm. uh, outvoted. I'm like, hey, I'm like the expert. I work in philanthropy. Right? Hey, why are you not listening to right. me? But they have these great ideas, right? Yeah. And you know, it usually it comes from something that's been in the news locally, nationally, at the state level. So that's what makes philanthropy meaningful for a lot of people, and it's what makes our work meaningful because it connects the people, not only those who give, but those who benefit from mm-hmm. it, right? So there, there's no purpose for philanthropy if that isn't your goal every mm-hmm. single day. On the flip side, we have a very unique seat where we get to see a lot of what's going on in the community. And we can, on behalf of those with a big heart, sometimes make investments that they wouldn't know need to be made. So that's where unrestricted money helps us, right? It empowers us to say, okay, we've been given this charge by our donors to go out and make a difference. Where can we make a difference this Mm -hmm. year? What does this community need? Who's hurting? What opportunity? Where can we make innovation more feasible? Because it's not always just about need. Sometimes it's about, you know, what makes this community even better? A glass blowing studio would be a perfect example, right? Uh, And so to me, a healthy nonprofit, well, especially a healthy community foundation, is going to have a mix of those restricted and those unrestricted funds. We need both. So let's ask this question. If you, I know that one of the endowment funds um, at the community foundation is a boys for the boys and girls club. Sure. Um, they are powerhouse in thanks to Hick, Leslie Absher, yeah. um, in, in fundraising. Um, so how is donating to the boys and girls club through the foundation different than donating just directly to the boys and girls club? Well, I mean, there's a couple of ways to think about it. We never discourage anybody from giving to a nonprofit directly that they care about. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's the most effective way to mm-hmm. use your philanthropic dollars. But there, well, we have an endowment for the Boys and Girls Club at the Community Foundation, right? So that's more about the sustainability of the organization for the long term. So sometimes people will want to give to an endowment to support an organization like the Boys and Girls Club, and we have 80 different funds for different nonprofits and many being created you know, every year Mm -hmm. for different uh, entities. So that's one way to think about giving to the community foundation. Short-term versus long-term a little bit? Short-term versus long-term a little bit. Um, You know, you may be giving to them today um, because they're trying to... Their air conditioner broke and they need to get fixed. Or you are trying to help them create the new facility at Crestmont, which is exceptional, right? absolutely. So incredibly needed, Mm -hmm. and we supported that too. Yeah. There's the rub, right? So you're giving to them, but so are we. Yeah. Some of our unrestricted money we use to make a grant okay. to them so that we, too, could maybe give maybe a bigger gift than mm-hmm. some people could. I think we gave them 
$50,000, you know, at one time for mm-hmm. that facility. We've given them lots of grants over the years. So for a lot of people, right, by giving to us through an unrestricted fund versus mm-hmm. the restricted Boys and Girls Club mm-hmm. endowment, you have the opportunity for us to make things possible that we don't even know they need yet, mm-hmm. right? So we grow our unrestricted funds, and, you know, they'll um, this year they've asked, I'm trying to remember, they've asked us for a grant this year. I think it's also for fifty thousand dollars. We're con- we're considering it currently. Mm-hmm. So, your giving is important to them. Our ability to give them chunks of larger dollars at times is also important to them. So, really, just figuring out you know what's most important to you. Mm-hmm. You may want to do both. I yeah. would never discourage that. But a long term restricted endowment can really help them sustain their operation. They can count on that money coming in every single year. They don't have to raise it. You know, it's one it's one check that they aren't going out and having to ask anybody for every yeah. year. On the flip side, by giving to an unrestricted fund, you allow us to give to lots of different nonprofits, mm-hmm. including the Boys Club, Boys and Girls Club, every year. So this year we're we got forty seven requests for grants, mm-hmm. right? We'll probably end up funding about 15 of them. Okay. It's a super hard choice. We, yeah. just, we just narrowed it down to 20 and invited them to apply for mm-hmm. a full grant. Um, but it's just about, you know, sort of the universe of possibilities and the universe of needs for mm-hmm. nonprofits. Um, and as I understand it, um, when you donate to an endowment, because that money is getting invested, mm-hmm. it's also really maximizing, multiplying and maximizing right. your money. Right. Which right. is a great idea because we always feel like there's not enough money to go around for all the nonprofits and all of the needs. And so if there are ways through investing, and I assume you've got very savvy <laughs> people helping you invest the money um, and then understand words like annuity, uh, unlike myself. So we have a $35 million endowment, wow. and the vast majority of that's uh, invested somewhat aggressively mm-hmm. compared to what the average person might do because mm-hmm. we're going to be here forever. So. Yeah. You know, 70 some odd percent of it's in, invested in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can recover if something happens well, and you're. Because we're here for the long yeah. term, we can really manage the ups and downs mm-hmm. of the market, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so we are uh, investing those dollars, and of course, the goal is to grow them, but more importantly, to sustain the endowment over time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're looking at what do we need to make on these investments every year so we can cover the distribution and inflation and mm-hmm. operating costs. So, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a complicated formula, but we do have really wise people. You know, we do a RFP every few years and, sure. um, and hire somebody to manage those dollars. Yes. Yeah. The thoughts that are going through my head um, during this second segment is just speaking about this it, with like my estate planner and my financial advisor. Mm-hmm. So we talk about when we meet once a year just to kind of update our our paperwork and we're talking about our idea is when we hit a certain age and we're, you know, our goal was, uh, you know, retirement, uh, college, college. Yeah. For the children and then, uh, giving. And that was the third one, Mm -hmm. but we've never talked about how we're going to set that up. Like once we're gone or or anything like that. So I started thinking this is a conversation that, um, and others too, I guess could be having with their estate planners. Um, and you know, you know, and I believe that if they contacted the community foundation, there would be people that would happily talk with them about mm-hmm. all of their options. Yeah, too. absolutely. Um, because you do legacy planning. There are a lot of uh, funds like mm-hmm. that. We work with a lot of professional advisors. Right? Okay. We do. And, you know, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, folks will come and say there's something really specific that I'd like to accomplish with my estate. Mm-hmm. Uh, generally speaking, it's not their whole uh, estate, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. we say even just 5% of yeah. someone's estate makes a huge difference yeah. um, for the community in the long term. But, um, yeah, and so we enter into this very simple one-page agreement that says, you know, proceeds from my IRA or from my insurance policy or from my estate or whatever it might be um, will be used to do this. And sometimes they want to establish a new fund mm-hmm. uh, to do something. We just had someone this week that established a fund that we won't. I probably won't see in my lifetime. We're in no hurry. For <laughs> uh, but, you know, that will set up a fund for mental health. We don't have a mental health fund oh, at wow. the Community Foundation. No one's ever set that up. And so, you know, but we'll have people then say, I would like my estate to benefit seven different organizations. 
That's another reason to work with the community foundation is sometimes someone will come to us and say, I have a gift I want to make today or tomorrow in mm-hmm. the long term, mm-hmm. and I want it to impact lots of different organizations. Can you manage that for me? Mm-hmm. You know, they give us the mm-hmm. gift. We cut all the checks. We send all the letters. We write all the thank yous. Um, but, you know, I don't want to mislead anybody. Um, you know, there are so many different ways for people to work with us, and some of them are very simple, and some of them are complicated, involve annuities mm-hmm. and, um, you know, uh, complicated uh, gift uh, you know, tools, but a lot of it's just quite simple, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just about like any other nonprofit going on our website and making a gift or sending a check or being part of a giving circle. Um, and you know, gifts of any size are welcome. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that too because mm-hmm. I think my instinct is, yeah, you know, well, I'm not rich, so um, you know, the the foundation. I can't really help the foundation, but I don't think that's true. No, and I think, you know, to your point earlier, and you guys are pretty smart about all of this, uh, a lot of what we do is about pooling, Mm -hmm. pooling funds, right? Which I love. I just love that idea. Um, We were talking over break, and I want to touch on it because 100 Women Who Care, Mm -hmm. um, is that something that came from the foundation? And 50 Men Who Care as well. Um, Is that something that came from the foundation, or did someone approach the foundation and say, we'd like to do this kind of circle of giving and... So we had been looking very specifically at a way to engage women in giving. Women like to give socially. They like to pool their dollars. Mm-hmm. It's uh, men as well, but mm-hmm. it seems to be a little bit more prevalent with women. And so we had to be exploring the idea of a giving circle right before I actually joined the Community Foundation. And one of our really close friends, her name's Carol Maloney, mm-hmm. she had learned about um, 100 women mm-hmm. from, uh, I think, a group in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and came to us and said, I have this idea could we be partners? And yeah. the whole thing has grown from that and then resulted, of course, in now 50 men who care. Yeah. And and 100 women who care is more like 200. Or yeah, it's, and 50 men is more like 75. Yeah, so, yeah, 100 yeah. women is usually between 180 and 200. It fluctuates right. over time. But what a powerful way to yeah. give, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and we were talking about this, and so I want to explain it to anyone who uh, is not familiar with the concept. And, and uh, I've been involved on and off with 100 women who care, and it's um, they come together once a quarter, and they have presentations um, from their members <clears throat> who are requesting support for an organization they feel passionately about, and the presentations are always, um, you know, you can't sit through it and not cry. Um, and then they vote, and the winning organization, everybody writes a $100 check to. So when you're talking about 100, 150 women, 180 women, I mean, that's $18,000 that could mm-hmm. be dropped into a budget that some of these nonprofits or budgets are, you know, $100,000. Right. And to have that one night, and I experienced it as a board member of Girls, Inc., um, and eh, we went to the meeting. We all put our names into – there were several board members there to talk about Girls, Inc., and then we all prayed that we would get picked but not get picked because it's a little terrifying. And Angela Martin was the, the one who – she got picked, and she was – amazing in her um plea and uh, and girls inc uh, won that prize and and you could i mean it was just life changing really for the organization and so um i was talking about this with somebody else this morning on a different topic but you know giving five dollars you may not feel like you can make an impact but when you have a hundred people giving five dollars you really can make a huge difference yeah i don't know if you guys followed at all we had a thrive by five giving day the mm-hmm. last couple of years right mm-hmm. where we had our friend jamie was one of the heroes mm-hmm. yeah and she is and she is a hero isn't yes, she? she is. and um and so you know all these different folks and it really was born out of this idea and i almost hate to say this but on my 55th birthday i said you know <laughs> gosh i am not very happy about being 55 and so i'm going to try to raise fifty five thousand dollars for early learning that will make me happy about oh, this wow. birthday mm-hmm. um and so it I raised fifty seven thousand wow, dollars, right? And so it was job. this idea of how community can come yeah. together through gifts of five dollars or five hundred dollars mm-hmm. um, and really make a difference, right? Mm-hmm. And so at the community foundation, there are ways for you to give to an existing fund that allows us to pool those resources, whether your gift is twenty dollars or two hundred dollars. But there are other people that come to us and say, I'd like to establish a fund. And to do that, that's $20,000, yeah. but you can do that over five years. And so there's not a gift that's not welcomed and that's not valued yeah. at the Community Foundation. And they can be simple or they can be complicated. Um, but we're really equipped to help people do that. But we do that, and I always like to stress this. 
we are not a fundraising organization. We don't exist because we want to raise money. You don't have any bake sales? And- we don't have any <laughs> bake sales, and I'm all for bake sales. But the point here, even those who have bake sales, they never do it just for the purpose of raising money. Yeah. It's what they can accomplish Awareness. with that money. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think it's been in the paper a lot this year, but one that's been so meaningful to me is a grant we gave last year to the History Center. Mm-hmm. Oh, they for the were aging. They the Alzheimer's Yes, program, we talked right? about that. We and, had them on as a yeah. show guest, and they I talked mean, about that. We, you know, time after time have the opportunity to invest in these great organizations. So the number of things. Thousands and thousands of donors have given us money to establish this $35 million endowment and growing uh, that allow us now to have returned close to $30 million back to our community through grants. Wow. We return a couple million dollars a year in various ways back to the community each and every year, mm-hmm. right, to create impact that just, you know, spreads across the community through these many different organizations, the 400 different ones that we've supported over the years to do great work, right? So it's really that very simple gift, whether that's $10 or 200 or 20000 then it's just really activating this entire mm-hmm. network of people that are just really trying to make this place the best possible place that can be for people, for people. Yep. It's always about people. And I feel like that's the note we should end on. Yeah, I'm about to cry. <laughs> <laughs> We've made Karen cry again. Success. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining yeah, us and shedding you. some light. Like I said, I feel like, you know, we, we knew the name. We knew it was out there. We knew it did good things, but we didn't really understand some of the specifics. So I hope people um, who have listened to this will, you know, think about um, on any sort of scale how they can um, support the community. And the people. So thank you. And we will be back with another episode. You are at home in Bloomington. Got a show idea? I'd love to hear it. And be sure to contact me for all your real estate needs and questions too. You can email me at deb at realrealestatetoday.com. And follow me on Facebook at Deb Tomorrow Realtor. To contact Karen Rastel for all your mortgage needs, call 812-606-7653 or log on to ruoff.com and go to the Bloomington Center. Thanks to all the Bloomington people who make production of At Home in Bloomington possible. Special thanks to superstar producer Rachel Gregorio, digital guru Cynthia Hogan at Monster Digital Marketing for website design and hosting, and video genius Wes Lasher in the production house for engineering the show. <laughs>